Hello, my name is Espen. I'm the lead front-end developer here at Ucommerce, and I will talk a little bit about Condo, the present and the future. So first, let's go through an agenda here. So the first thing is we're going to talk a little bit about what Condo actually is. Some of you might already know what Condo is, and some of you might have just forgotten. The next step we're going to look into is our new UI component library. Um, after that, we're going to take one of those components and try and dissect it to see what bits it actually consists of. Um, after that, we're going to have a look at extensibility of UCommerce. And uh, lastly, hopefully, there'll be some questions. Um, okay. Still can't tick. Have an issue here with the ticker or the clicker. So what is Condo again? There we go. It's actually working now. Thank you. <laughs> so um, some of you might have heard of this already, but Condo's mission is to spark joy. Or actually, if we look at the name Condo, it comes from Marie Condo, um, and she's famous for just you know using the uh, coining the term something should spark joy, otherwise get rid of it. And uh, the thing with Condo is the way we want to spark joy is we want to see if we can make the e-commerce experience um, pleasant to work in. We do this by, for instance, applying a minimalistic design. Um, we also want to improve the workflows a little bit so that they're more e-commerce centric. And uh, we also want to have confident users. Um, we do that by making sure that they can actually undo an action they performed and that the data they entered is auto saved and so on. Um, the next thing is that we want to create a focused experience. By that we mean that we are trying to split out workflows into separate apps so that they're not intertwined. In short, um, we're basically just taking the previous platform and making a nicer one. So how do we actually go about that? Um, one of the things we've done is we've introduced a new UI component library. And uh, this library is uh, something like this. We, um, in order for a component to go into a component library, we have a couple of criteria that we want to uh, make sure that it adheres to. First of all, a component should be decoupled. By that, we mean that it shouldn't really know about what parent it has and it shouldn't know anything about what children it has. It just knows that it's there. For instance, a button doesn't know whether or not it lives in a modal. It doesn't know whether or not it lives in a modal or in an app or in a page. It just lives in a void. The next thing is it should have a single responsibility. So if we're talking about the button again, uh, the button should do what a button does. It can show some text, perhaps, perhaps an icon. That's basically just something you inject into the button. And it should also uh, be able to emit a click event. It shouldn't really do much else than that. Um, next thing is it should be composable. And this is what I was talking about before uh, with the button that we, a button for instance, would have one or more slots that you can inject other components into. This could be a text node, but it could also be a Vue.js component, for instance. And uh, I actually forgot to mention earlier, the entire condo um, project is built uh, in Vue.js, at least the front end bit. Next thing is it should be testable. Fortunately, this goes very well in hand with the previous um, things I've mentioned, because when it's decoupled and it's composable and has a single responsibility, it makes it fairly easy to test. And lastly, but not least, it has to be well documented. Um, nothing is worse than using a, a component that you don't actually know how to use. Um, and this is actually where the next step comes in. So we use a tool called Storybook to help us with this. Um, this shouldn't be so focused on the tooling, but I still, I still would like to mention it because Storybook has helped us uh, work in a sort of decoupled mindset, right? It makes us think in, in a different way than when you work with just a component placed in a page in an app and so on. So how does it do that? Well, it does that by basically creating a sandbox for each component. And within that component, you can then, with it, sorry, you, what you actually do is you create a story as it's called, and you can create several stories for a component. And this is 
um, bringing me to the next point, which is state can be expressed as stories. And uh, so for instance, if you have a button and the button has a, um, it can be disabled. That would be a state. Um, you would write a story for that. That means um, users, uh, actually your fellow colleagues, and in this case, the colleagues on, on, on our team here, would be able to see, okay, so uh, Luisa created the button component and it can actually receive a disabled state, sorry, disabled prop, and then become disabled. And this is how it looks when it's disabled. It also allows us to easily stress test uh, components. It, uh, Storybook has something called controls, which allows you to alter the props that go into the component. That means you can, for instance, try and see how does the button behave when you enter 250 characters into it, or special characters, or whatever. Um, and then the most important bit, I think, is that it does automated documentation. Besides showing a nice little visual representation of the uh, component, and you can fiddle, you know, fiddle a little bit with the component, try and see whether or not when you click it, it actually does what it's supposed to do. You can also um, make Storybook auto-generate documentation. And it does that by analyzing the component and looking for things like doc blocks. So if you have a view component and you have a, uh, a prop, you can uh, take that prop and annotate it with a doc block. And that would then be output into the documentation, which is pretty cool. Um, a bonus feature that most front-end developers at least will really appreciate is the fact that it has built-in hot reloading. To me, that is just, it's, a, it's just a joy to work with. I highly recommend it. Even if you're not doing anything for e-commerce, just try it. It's great. So, so now we've looked at these components here, or rather storybook. So let's try and actually take a component and try and dissect it. This is not going to be the button component because that would probably be a little bit too simple. So let's try and have a look at the navigator component. The navigator component is a somewhat abstract component. It requires to be um, composed of several other navigator related components. Uh, what the navigator does is it's very similar to the finder on your Mac or the explorer on Windows. Um, it basically just provides a way that you can traverse an item tree. So the thing is, as I mentioned before, the navigator can't really do much on its own. Um, so let's try and actually look, let, let, let's try and look at an actual implementation of the navigator. And uh, funnily enough, Sean actually kind of showcased it before. It's the uh, media navigator. So the media navigator actually, it, it, it uh, implements the navigator, the navigator view, and the navigator node. And here is the content navigator that Sean also touched upon. It's the same component, just composed in a different way. Um, let's see. Right. So let's try and have a look at how we would actually compose an instance of the navigator component. As you see, highlighted with blue, we have the outermost component, which is the navigator. The navigator consists then of a navigator view and a navigator node. Okay, Ooh, I actually went a bit too far. There we go. The navigator node is, sorry, the navigator implements one or more views. And by that, I mean that you can choose whether or not you want your nodes displayed in a grid view or in a row view, whatever you decide, really. Um, and uh, you can even make it a dynamic component so users can uh, choose to switch the view um, at runtime, uh, just like you're used to from, from your Explorer or Finder. Um, some, some data is best presented in a grid view, that might be a gallery, and some data is just best presented in a list. Um, right, so the navigator node, the last one, it's actually kind of like an optional helper component. It, it employs some of the um, common states that you would have for a node, like how does it look when it hovers? In this case, in our case, actually, it shows a little um, outline around the, um, the node that you're currently hovering. How does it look when it's active? That means when you're actually clicking or holding your mouse down on the uh, object. And how does it look when it's selected? Um, and also it emits a click event. 
So whenever you're implementing this node, you know that you're getting all these things served uh, from us, basically. You could also create your own, but you would just have to adhere to the same interface. So, so um, we basically created this component in order to streamline the look and feel across all navigator implementations in the system. So let's try and actually have a look at a small but simple navigator node uh, implementation. Here we're dealing with an image. Again, th these examples are somewhat contrived. Uh, so don't worry if they're not like the code is not 100%. It's written so that you would understand it to a certain degree because yeah, that's just how it is. You know how it is actually. So um, here we have a my image node component and the my image node component uh, uh, implements a navigator node. It then provides to the node prop of the navigator node, it provides a my image object. This is just a property that lives on the my image node component. And uh, it then also tells the navigator node whether or not it's selected. And it also listens for the click event of the navigator node. Through its default slot, the navigator node then provides the actual node that was passed in. So the node that you see in the default slot is basically the object called my image object. And that is then passed down to the image that the my image node component injects into the navigator node. So the my image node component knows that a image node has a source attribute or property. Um, therefore, because the navigator node doesn't know this, the navigator node is fairly dumb. Um, so, so it's up for the, uh, the, the wrapper component to set this up. So when we look at the big picture here, and I have to step a bit closer because I have to read some source code. <laughs> um, so we have a uh, media navigator. Again, this is a somewhat simplified version of our media navigator, but it gets the point across. So the media navigator uh, takes some nodes that it received from a backend API, and it then injects it into the navigator as nodes. The navigator then, uh, what's it called, uh, gives those nodes to the component it's wrapping, which in this particular case is a navigator view component. But as you can see in the first comment there where it says dynamic navigator view component, it doesn't actually say that it's a navigator view component, it just says it's a component. That's because it's using a view a dynamic component. So we can then um, say that if if the user has selected to show items in a grid view or in a row view, it will render out the particular view that the user has requested. You can also hard code it if you want to, if you don't need this toggling at runtime. Um, so what the view does is the view will iterate over all the nodes in the collection it was given by the navigator. And for each node, it's gonna render that out into, um, oh sorry, for each node, it's gonna expose the node each individual node on its default slot. And in the default slot, if you look at comment number two, it says dynamic navigator node component. This is where the uh, quote unquote magic happens. It, uh, it just takes the node and it looks up in a map and checks which component should I use to render this node. Did I receive a, a folder? Did I receive an image? I don't know. Um, so it'll render out that component. And if you look to the right, that's where the Again, fairly simplistic uh, maps are set up. Um, okay, so let's carry on. So what this means is that the navigator is extremely open for extension, and that kind of works as a segue to this topic here, which is open for extension. Um, going forward, because you might actually be asking yourself, what can I use this for? This is something you use internally. I don't really care that much, but you should because we will be able to open this up to you eventually. Right now, there's not a complete certain time frame on it, but it will definitely will become reality soon, hopefully. Some of the things you'll be able to extend will be um, translations. You kind of use that. Extension points, you also know that. But this is obviously all going through the condo UI. Um, property editors and apps. And uh, as a new addition, uh, there will also be sections. So that will allow you to create a uh, group of property editors that uh, make sense to have grouped together or bundled together. 
So for instance, uh, let's say you need a custom property so for Google Maps. Uh, that's not a problem. You can uh, choose to use our component library to compose one. You can also obviously decide to write your own. Uh, it's really up to you. But if you want to carry on with the e-commerce look and feel, we highly recommend that you, uh, that you use uh, our component library. Um, let's see. That was basically it. Thank you for your patience.